I love to read about great moments in history that change the world for the better. It's inspiring to see what happens when God moves in the hearts of people and what happens when a great cause becomes a shared cause and the power of everybody kicks in. In this study, we're going to learn from and be inspired by one of the great leaders of the Bible. His name is Nehemiah. And he called people to live for a purpose higher than themselves. And he told them they could do something great together. More than that, he led the people through a process that led to something akin to a great awakening. And it's my highest hope that our time together as a group would be more than just a study, but that we would allow Nehemiah to lead us through the very same process he led his people through, and that we might experience a great awakening of our own. Now you're thinking, that's a lot to expect of a very short study. And yes, this study is just six sessions long. If your group meets once a week, it will take you six weeks or about 40 days to complete the study. If your group meets less frequently, it will take your group longer. But a lot can happen in 40 days. 40 days in the Bible is a season of transformation. Noah's life was transformed by 40 days of rain. The life of Moses was transformed by 40 days on the mountain. The city of Nineveh was utterly transformed in, you want to guess? Yep, 40 days. And Jesus was enabled for ministry in his 40 days in the wilderness. A lot can happen in 40 days. And I really believe if we give ourselves to a 40-day process that includes reading and reflection and some confession and commitment and celebrating, that at the end of those 40 days, we will be changed and perhaps a corner of our world might be changed as well. And if it all doesn't quite happen that way or we need to hold back in some fashion, it will at the very least be a fascinating study in life and leadership and change. So let me set the stage historically. Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests. They were supposed to be a blessing to the world. They were supposed to be a reflection of God's kingdom on heaven here on earth, but it never quite was realized fully. And then in 586 BC, the superpower of the day, Babylon, attacked the city of Jerusalem and just laid it flat, destroyed the temple, destroyed everything, carried off many of the key inhabitants of the city to live in exile in Babylon. And it seemed like the great dream of Israel becoming a great nation was dead. But the prophets foretold of a time when the people scattered would be regathered. And it seemed like that prophecy might be coming true when 50 years later, some of the exiles were allowed to return to the city of Jerusalem. There was a new superpower at play. Uh, Persia was now in charge. Persia had beaten Babylon and Persia had a different approach to the exiles. Now remember the exiles had lived away from their homeland for decades. They had settled down and started families. And this is Nehemiah. Nehemiah likely was born and raised in exile, far from his homeland, but he still had a heart for his home and a heart for the capital city of Jerusalem. He had a cushy job at this time. He was the cup bearer to the king at the palace. That's something like being head of security at the palace. A cup bearer would actually drink from the cup of wine of the king before it was served to the king and eat the food before it was served to the king just to test to make sure it wasn't poisonous. It was a very dangerous job in that time and place, but also shows that Nehemiah had the trust of the king and that's gonna be important to this story. So let's take a look at the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, chapter one, the story of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah asks these friends, how's it going back in Jerusalem? And they say, not well, Nehemiah. The walls have been destroyed and the gates have been burned. And Nehemiah knew what this meant. In that time and place, a city without walls was vulnerable. 
A city with walls had security. A city with walls, uh, children could play and commerce could be conducted and worship could happen freely. But in a city without walls, there is violence and danger and even scorn from other nations. And Nehemiah grieved this. He wept over this. He felt this to his bones. Uh, you can tell a lot about somebody by what moves them to tears. What moves you to tears? You know, there are broken walls all around us in our world. Uh, broken walls in, in families and in, in systems and in schools. Where is there a broken wall that breaks your heart? Nehemiah's heart was broken for the broken walls of Jerusalem. He was concerned for the inhabitants of the city. He was concerned for the reputation of his God, and he just can't stand it. He's got to do something about it. He is caught up in this. He feels it to his bones. He weeps, he mourns, and he prays. And he prays this fantastic prayer. I want to read it to you. He prays, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This is a really good prayer. Nehemiah is facing a really big problem, but he chooses not to focus on the bigness of his problem, but on the bigness of his God. He begins his prayer, the great and awesome God. That's a very good place to start the great and awesome God. And Nehemiah is not just buttering up God for this big request that's coming later. He is reorienting himself in the reality that there is a great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. It's a great place to start our prayer. Now, uh, of course, we have to be honest. Do I really believe that there is a great and awesome God? And if I don't, I've got to be honest about that, and I've got to seek and pray and search. But Nehemiah begins with this rock-solid conviction that there is a great and awesome God who keeps his promises. And then he goes on and he confesses his sins, his personal sins, the sins of his family, and the sins of his nation. That could be a very fascinating conversation all by itself. And then he gets to the big ask. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This man, he's referring to the king. Nehemiah is going to ask the king for help. Nehemiah is going to need some time off to go supervise the building project, and he's going to approach the king. Now listen, all of this, throughout Nehemiah, uh, we're going to see this is not about what Nehemiah can do all by himself. This is about what God and Nehemiah can do together. I heard someone say that discipleship with Jesus is learning what God and I can do together. Discipleship with Jesus is learning what God and I can do together. This is the reality of Nehemiah's life. He's living this kingdom kind of life. So where is there a broken wall that God is calling you to fix with him? I'd like you to think about this. And as you discern what God's calling you to do, I'd like you to think not just about need, but about nudge, right? There are needs everywhere, an overwhelming number of needs. But which need is God nudging you toward? Which need has your heart? This week, let's all do what Nehemiah did and pray for the concerns of your heart. And we'll pick up the story of Nehemiah next time we get together. Thanks for joining me.